Um, hopefully, you can give us an update on the the how screwed we are. What's going on here? Yeah, how screwed we are. Yes, okay. <laughs> Um, you know the weather is just absolutely crazy lately. Was it twelve feet of snow and like east east of San Francisco and wildfires in Texas and ice glaciers melting even more quickly than ever. And essentially no snow. Heat, re- heat records. Essentially no snow. Essentially yeah, no. It's, e- uh, essentially no snow in all of New England this year. Right. It rained. Yeah. No, it's not. Rained. Not, it no. rained. It rained and rained, it rained and rained. And rained. Yes. Which is a sign of warmth. Yes. Um, so, I don't know why we're talking. Yeah, so, anyway. Um, okay, well, you want to just get started? There's no reason. It's like a minute away, so we're good. Want yeah. to get started? Fire away. All right, here we go. Here we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Illinois Green Party. I'm your host, David Rich. We have a recurring guest here, Dr. Guy McPherson. Hello, Mr. McPherson. How are you, sir? I'm practically perfect in every way, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> That's from Mary. Thanks Mer- for coming back on, because last time we were on, it was... Huh? No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Last time we had you on, you gave us some uh, a, a pretty oh, a serious walloping of information there um, concerning uh, what's going on globally. Uh, with climate change and whatnot, uh, and so I thought it'd be apt, especially in the the, the, the thick of all this not so weather going on again. As we mm-hmm. were just saying, you know, twelve feet of snow, you know, east of San Francisco, wild um, fires in Texas, you know, five times the size of New York City, um, little to no snow in the East Coast, but a lot of rain, which again is a sign of temperatures rising. Um, so uh, just just not so stuff going on. And, uh, you know, just on, on another side of this whole thing, and people in, uh, across Europe are protesting, like, intensely. Have you heard about the farmers' protests across Europe? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Just, oh, yeah. And it's, like, unfortunate because, I mean, they're actually advocating for, like, keeping the fertilizers and the synthesizers and so on, which is not great that they're doing that. But I cannot fault them for being upset. Right. Um, because like, the EU is just coming in with these draconian regulations, <laughs> right or wrong. That's not the point here. Uh, it's just uh, devastating on them. Um, so it's really, really tough. Um, and uh, it's just, it's a mess. It's a mess. Because uh, this is one of my fears, you know, just on the socio politically economic level of all of this, is you're just going to have like diverge, di- disparate uh, uh, opinions, ideologies of what to do that are going to get angry on all possible sides and just converge on each other at one point. Um, that's not great. Anyway, um, on to you, sir. What, what, what's going on? How how further along are we than we were about what our law is six, seven, eight months ago? Well, it's pretty interesting. Um, I quoted a paper in the annual review of Earth and Planetary Sciences for a few years. It indicated that we would have an ice-free Arctic Ocean in 26, 2016 plus or minus three years. And so... I made the proclamation that we're going to be extinct by 2017. And fortunately, right. that that paper ton, turned out to be incorrect. They used a linear projection. And so they, that okay. turned out to point to the wrong answer. Now, interestingly, the lead author of that paper is leading an, another effort through his institution. He's a professor at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. And so they have begun, I think it was two and a half years ago, they started with a six-month ensemble forecast, which is an actual prediction, not a projection, and it's rooted in abundant information. And so far, it has been very conservative from a scientific standpoint. That is, there was less ice in the Arctic Ocean last year than they projected there would be, but for the year or two, I can't remember which it was, before that, they were scientifically conservative. In any event, I suspect that they will continue to put out a conservative forecast, and what that means is about the first week of April this year, we will know whether we will have an ice-free Arctic Ocean or not 
in late September. Now that's really important to know because an ice-free Arctic Ocean has not happened in some 70,000 years since before there was any civilization present on the planet and the rate of environmental change in the wake of an ice-free Arctic Ocean will be so stunningly catastrophically rapid that I can't imagine will survive much less almost any other species on the planet so that's a bummer okay yeah no that's it's a huge bummer sorry about that I didn't realize you were, you were uh, in a lull there um, yeah no that's a huge bummer bummer's a nice word for that um, and uh, let, let's, let's kind of go talk about why that is the case like it would, you know, some people might not be in there I'll be like okay what does it care what does it matter if there's no ice in, it, in the Arctic who cares Right, and uh, so there's sun reflecting back in the science behind that. Yeah, the the ice floating on the Arctic Ocean serves as a primary source of albedo, or reflectance of incoming sunlight. Right. So without that ice, imagine going from this to <laughs> this. You know, you switch. You just switch some, some from something white with ice and snow to something deep blue, and as a consequence, just looking at albedo alone, that will be sufficient to increase. According to a peer-reviewed paper in Nature Communications, put out June fifteenth, twenty twenty-one, that will be enough to increase just the loss of aerosol masking by 133 percent over land this is this is a, a huge change in a very short period of time and because every species on the planet has evolved through natural selection to persist in the location where it is evolving through natural selection with all the species around it well, you change one fundamental variable by a profound amount, and that's going to be problematic for our species and almost certainly every other species on the planet. We evolved for a certain set of conditions, and you change those conditions, and we no longer are happily getting along. No, it's uh, devastating. And the... the the amount of ice on the Arctic Ocean is the single most important issue over which we have the least control. There's nothing you and I can do to change whether we're going to have an ice free Arctic Ocean or not. And in fact, um, renowned professor, where, where did he go? Where did that information go? James Anderson the Harvard atmospheric scientist for discovering the link between chlorofluorocarbons and the Antarctic ozone hole said, quote, the chance there will be permanent ice in the Arctic after 2022 is essentially zero. Here we are. It's 2024. So he was wrong by at least two years. And that was in Forbes on January 15th, 2018. Fast forward to April 23rd, 2021, Jennifer McKinnon, who is at the University of California, San Diego, and also at the Scripps Institution, part of the Scripps Institute, said she expects a nice free Arctic Ocean in 2022. And so here's a couple of renowned scholars who missed it by at least a couple or three years. And so hopefully that'll keep happening. Hopefully we're going to get this wrong. Hopefully we're going to get this, yeah, for for at least a very long time. <laughs> yeah, um, that's not going to happen. And that's okay. So I want to talk about this too because this is important. Because a lot of times I see, at least amongst the, in the public, uh, people say, "See, the scientists were wrong. Therefore, it's not going to happen." Right. Um, no, that just means we just sort of push it off a little bit. Uh, yes. Predictions are very difficult to do. Um, for sure, no doubt. So, like, if was, if scientists gets one wrong, that does not mean that the said phenomenon is not going to occur. It means it's just it's probably coming at that point of being wrong. Uh, it's coming probably even more quickly than you think it is, um, <laughs> because they're not one hundred percent incorrect in their analysis. Right. Predictions are just. Weird. 
Right. Okay. And I, I think it was Yogi Berra, Yogi Berra, who's the the master of the malapropism, who said predictions are difficult, especially about the future. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he, he might have been the most witty person ever. Like he's right. just so highly quotable. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> that's funny. I like that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's tough. It's tough stuff, you know, especially, you know, in climate patterns are very complex. A lot of variables, a lot of components involved there, a lot of relationships and configurations and reconfigurations moment to moment. It's tough to do. Um, right. Now, they're generalized because the patterns are so large. It's, it's it kind of easy to generalize them and get some ideas there. Um, but uh, again, just don't don't think because these, these scientists were incorrect by a couple of years that it's not going to happen because it just means it's happening. It's coming sooner than later. Right, right. At this point. Absolutely. It's going, it's going to happen if we, if we keep on this track. Right, absolutely. Unless the aliens come down and change <laughs> <laughs> so, If that's what you're hoping for, you, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to hold my breath, but I'm just looking for, like, you know, at least, you know, logically possible options. Right. Um, so real quick, I'm supposed to say hi to Reagan Parenton. Hello, sir. How are you? Lone Wanderer 99. We've got Obsolete Optics on here. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, they're, they're having... They're chatting here on the side. So, yeah, anybody who sees on the kind of the right here in those comments, you want to ask, you know, have questions, comments, concerns for Dr. McPherson, uh, please, please feel free. Um, so, yeah. Um, oh, and Andrew Bryan is, is watching, so thank you. Um, okay, so what, what what do you think about the, the political situation going on globally as far as, like, uh, what, was, what was the name of that uh, gathering, the big one? Oh, it's an acronym. Oh, 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 oh COP. COP, the Conference of Parties? Yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah. It or was, they, just, they realized that they really hadn't done enough. Yeah, <laughs> 27 years in a row. 27 <laughs> Conference right. of Parties in a row. Yeah. And, well, what do you know? All those people still don't... None of them will talk... None of them will, will tell us that we're above 2C already. And the, the 2C idea... Oh, the two yeah, nothing... The 2C idea, by the way, came from an economist, William Nordhaus. He's the one who said it's 2C. Okay. Now, the Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases, the predecessor to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases said we should be worried about 1 degree C, not 2. That at 1 degree C, we've triggered these self-reinforcing feedback loops. Well, we're beyond 2 now, according to Andrew Weiglickson's October 9th, 2020 book, The Event Horizon, and a few governments of the world joined Glickson in October 2023. You can find that information at guymcpherson.com with a post from October 30th, 2023. So earlier in that month, several government agencies, including NASA in the United States, concluded that we were beyond two. And Regan Parenton, who you mentioned is is in the chat uh -huh. there pointed that out to me so thanks to Regan okay. for that information Thank you, Regan. yeah that's uh okay so that that's that's the yeah that's the tipping point isn't it that's the critical point yes um, yes because it triggers self-reinforcing feedback loops over which we no longer have control and e even one self-reinforcing feedback loop makes climate change irreversible and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change concluded that we had triggered a self-reinforcing feedback loop in September of, I think it was 2022, it might have been 2021, with their report on um, oceans and the cryosphere. So, so we've already gone past the point of no return, and even the IPCC, which was designed to fail, has concluded as much. Um, and, I, and I point out that the IPC was designed to fail because it was created during the Reagan administration in the United States, and there is, wow. there's an article called How the IPCC Got Started at the Environmental Defense Fund blog, and it's written by Michael Oppenheimer. He is the Albert G. Milbank Professor of Geosciences and International Affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School and the Department of Geosciences at Princeton University. So this is a knowledgeable individual who actually went back and tr kept track of how the IPCC got started and concluded that it was designed to fail because of the Reagan administration 
And because it replaced the organization, the advisory group on greenhouse gases, that concluded that one degree C was past the point of no return. Interesting. And I do know that, yeah, but just, just because we were below, say, 1.5 degrees Celsius, or, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, Celsius, oh, 45, uh, didn't mean we were out of the woods. I mean, it was still an increase sufficient enough to do some damage. Was You know, at that point, they, we thought we could still kind of, like, maybe, you know, deter it and then do something about it. Two, done. Done. Right. <laughs> I mean, the thing you're going to do to stop that, if you're at two, we're at two degrees Celsius, it's it above uh, the start of the industrial revolution so 1750-ish uh the, yeah no it's over that, that's that sucks right um but okay yeah and so we're beyond two we have triggered self-reinforcing feedback loops which means climate change is irreversible the ip the ipcc also concluded in its october 8th 2018 report global warming of 1.5 degrees and that's 1.5 degrees c obviously and in that, they concluded that, quote, even abrupt geophysical events do not approach current rates of human-driven change, end quote. So what that means is what we're driving right now is going so fast that it exceeds the rate of change in the absence of the dinosaur extinction. When So, so we're, we're... Volcanoes erupting and earthquakes and solar flares and, you know, like that couldn't touch our, our, our advances. So, so we're beating an asteroid. We're we're so we're good. Yeah. We're so yeah. good. We're no, defeating we're an asteroid. Don't ever underestimate human intellect and will. <laughs> um, <laughs> creatively and especially destructively. If we want it gone, it's gone, baby. Um, so, yeah, no, that's nuts. And so you got twenty twenty. You still have twenty twenty six on your radar as far as like the the year. It's it's all the bad things go. Yeah, only if we have a nice free Arctic Ocean this year. Um, and, okay. and, and that conclusion was based on the ice-free Arctic Ocean predicted by James Anderson at Harvard and by Jennifer McKinnon at UC San Diego and the yeah. Scripps Institution. Mm -hmm. So if they're wrong by more than two years in the case of James Anderson and by more than three years in the case of Jennifer McKinnon, that would be awesome. Then, then that, that tells me we have a little bit more time. So so let's sit back. So let's cheer for all scientists to be wrong all the time. That's not exactly what I'm saying here. No, no, no. That'd be bad if scientists were wrong all the time. We would not have any facts or truths right. to contend with. Um, but uh, okay, yeah, no, that is a drag. Uh, do you ever like sit back and kind of like imagine what it's going to be like as it's going down? Um, oh, yeah. You know, like what 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 the social the public's reaction is going to be. I'm mean, like I think a lot like of just a war torn society like. Unfortunately, I think of like the imagery from like Gaza now, and it's going to be like that all over. Yes. You know, you know, it's going yes. to be just absolutely miserable and, and, and awful. Absolutely. I think Gaza is a precursor to what we're all facing. And it didn't get to Gaza first. It's been happening throughout Africa, especially northern Africa, for years, for, for many years. So the international conflicts have been going on for a very long time. You could argue that people people tell me all the time, what about water wars? When do they start? Well, Lester Brown pointed out in the 1970s that we're already fighting water wars. They're just disguised as grain wars. And one of the primary reasons there's a... There's, there's a one of the primary reasons... We don't call them wars anymore because they're approved by Congress. So one of the reasons there's a police action in Gaza right now, I'm sure, is because of the grains. That, that area grows a tremendous amount of grains and also has some remaining yeah. fossil fuels. Resources is probably the number one reason, or amongst all the reasons for war in all of history, resources is probably in most of those, in most of those lists of reasons why. Um, you know, I know that like there's this uh, theory or hypo, whatever, this suggestion that one of the reasons why uh, Israel, the nation, kept the land it kept is because of the aquifer that's underneath it. There's like this huge aquifer, and like nobody's giving that up. That's not gonna happen. Right. Um, so you know, so because resources are very fundamental to living. So that's how that goes. Right. You know, and people I, don't know how to share. People don't know how to share. There's still a lot of water in the world, folks. It's not that big of a deal. 
Okay, so <laughs> when when I was in when I was in graduate school, early in my graduate student days in the early nineteen eighties, my professors were talking about the Ogallala Aquifer, which is the biggest one in North America, and it was getting drained dry. This was in the, this was forty years ago. We knew it was getting drained forty years ago, and what did, what did we do? Must go faster. We've been draining it ever faster. Must go faster. It's one of your that's one of your mottos, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Or slogans. Yeah, I think must that's go that's that's a slogan of industrial civilization. Must go faster. It, it really is. That's that's it's almost a law. I think. I mean, it's just it's insane. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like I like technology. I'm not anti, I'm not a luddite. Um, but uh, I don't know the cost it it, it, it it takes on us to to get this you know cell phone in my hand. And I love my cell phone. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I love the fact that I can listen to any song and look up any question and read books. I have a thousand books on my cell phone. That's cool. Right. You know, but you know, but <laughs> I. Um, I Get you. So, long, long before I had one of these, and I was, I was a jerk. A lot of people would argue, would argue that I still am, but I, I delivered a presentation, and after I was done, I said, "Raise your hand if, like me, you don't have a cell phone," because we had just watched a short film about the coltan the complex ore that was being mined in africa and killing yeah. killing women and children oh wow, it's, it's terrible and so i thought that was a terrible thing Nobody said happy birthday is today your birthday um actually i turned 16 five days ago happy for happy 16 for happy sweet 16 there you go Lone Wanderer 99 said happy birthday so happy birthday guy so so that was on uh february 29th if you're keeping track Oh, you're you're one of those. So you're okay. So that's yeah. your actually, in a sense, you're mathematically actually. I'm six. I've had sixteen 16. birthdays. And <laughs> that's you, great. You look you look great. Nice. <laughs> my my ex used to tell me to act my age, <laughs> so I did, and she didn't appreciate that either. He said I, he said I do. <laughs> well, of course, that's that's for that. By the word ex is the pivotal one. There. <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> um, okay. Well. Uh, Let's talk more about more that's going on than in concerning the, the global climate change issue than just the, the Arctic ice uh, melting away. Uh, because obviously carbon dioxide is the, is the main uh, culprit here, uh, the increase in our carbon dioxide. Um, last time I checked, we were at about 440 parts per million, which is extraordinarily high. Like yes. Pleiocene, Pleiocene, is that, I'm going to say that right, uh, level? like So that's like a long time ago, folks, uh, when the Earth was mostly uninhabitable by people. Um, so, so we're, we're back, you know, it just takes a little time to kind of like kick in, right. um, to that extent. Can you, can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, there, there have already been seven species in the genus Homo that have gone extinct, mostly because of rapid changes of climate. And that was before we got on board, before Homo sapiens yeah. showed up. Actually, Homo sapiens sapiens, the wise ape. So we had to do it twice just to prove that we're doubly wise. And, and so we, we've had all these other species in the genus Homo go extinct, largely because of climate change. You think it can't happen to us? And, and this is something I, I read every day, mostly in my email inbox, that I'm lying, that, yeah. that I'm just making it up, that it can't possibly happen to us, blah, blah, blah. Well, don't you think there were some individuals of those previous species that were among the last individuals, and they're looking around and they're seeing everybody else died? But it's it, surely it can't, can't happen to me. It makes no sense. Uh, yes, and the, 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 it can't really happen to us. No, to, there's there's no there's no basis for that at all. I mean, obviously it can because it has a billion times. Bad things happen to people all the time. Um, so I don't know why you think you're like exempt from it. Um, but I mean, I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine out in Portland, Oregon, because that's a, that's a, we're on a fault line, and there's volcanoes all around. So everything I said, you know, um, my buddy was talking about getting a bug out bag, which is just a prep bag, so if things go bad, you can bug out right away, and you got like three, four days of supplies. My friend's like, "Oh, what makes you so special that that's going to happen here?" And I'm like, "Do bad things happen? People die of natural disasters every single day. So the real question is, what makes you so special that it won't happen to you?" Right. 
You right. know, I mean, just statistically, it's going to happen to somebody, to people all, you know, all over the globe. Uh, I don't know why you think you're exempt from danger. Um, so, <laughs> you know, nature doesn't, isn't that great. Um, so, yeah. Right. right. And, and because I didn't know much about climate change at the time, I left active, my, my active life on campus and moved to an off-grid homestead. I lived off-grid for more than 10 years because I thought that would, that would allow me to live a little bit longer. But then I discovered the best kept secret in climate science, which is the aerosol masking effect. And that's the, that's the consummate catch 22. So at the same time, industrial activity, at the same time, industrial activity produces those greenhouse gases that are warming up the planet. Industrial activity also produces these aerosols that go up into the stratosphere. It takes about five days for all of those aerosols to fall out of the atmosphere, according to James Hansen in several papers and presentations. So five days, five days. So if we slow down or stop industrial civilization, if everybody starts living off grid as I did, that would be a really bad idea because that would hasten our demise, not slow it down. So that was a classic case of how fucking stupid could I be? Somebody come and take me away. Um, that'd be fabulous. No, and by the most stretch, is, is he implying that he should go out with your Aquanet spray bottles and spray cans and start spraying it in order to keep the, the ultraviolet rays away from the surface of the earth? Please don't do that. But what is serious about this is that we are stuck. He's right. It's a conundrum. It's a, it's a, it's almost a paradox in a sense. Um, and you, you, know, you take it away bad things happen. You keep it there, bad things increase as well. I mean, it's just, it's a catch-22. It's a, you know, that's, we, we put ourselves here and that's, I don't know what to say about it, you know. I don't know. Yeah, well... Do you, do you ever think of, like, any sort of, like, extreme example of a, a, a solution to all this? Well, yes, but before I get there, somebody pointed out in the chat okay. that, that it's called the McPherson Paradox, because I think I was the first person oh. to point out that that the goal of must go faster if we actually slowed it or stopped it that would lead to an even more rapid rate of environmental change that would cause our extinction even sooner than where we're headed right now so that's the bummer part and because I rattled on for so long I already forgot what your, what your question was <laughs> sorry oh uh, do you see any sort of like very precise nuanced or extreme solution to all this well for a while i believed that the mere reflection framework which you can describe it find described at m e e r dot org and that stands for mirrors for earth's energy reflection or rebalancing in any event m e e r dot org and i thought that was a great idea when i first when when dr Yay Tao first came up with it and it didn't work. It didn't pan out. That's been, let's see, that was in 2018, I believe, when we were talking about it and it just hasn't gotten off the ground. I'm, sh I'm sure that, that a few billionaires and a few high-ranking government officials know about it, but nobody got on board and so here we are still waiting for somebody to save the day and I think it's too little too late if we're yeah. going to go that route. Yeah, no, I, okay. Yeah, like a lot of people would have to do that um, simultaneously or, or within proximity uh, to, to get that to accomplish anything. And yeah, I don't know if that would work. Um, and even if that was somehow like even slightly effective, there's still, of course, other things going on. Like, I mean, can you get the mere effect over the Arctic Ocean? Well... But that's what it's just on land. Right. Well... Uh, there are all kinds of ideas that have been floated around with the mirror reflection framework. One of them involves placement of the mirrors, and they can they the mirrors can have local positive effects. So if you can get everybody in your neighborhood to put mirrors in their backyard or on their roof, then that'll actually cool that particular location. If we can do the same thing, unfortunately, initially when I learned of the mirror reflection framework 
the idea was that it would re require enough mirrors, physical mirrors, to cover a relatively small amount of land. But the most recent thing I've seen indicates that it will require an area the size of the United States. I don't know if that's the continental United States or the whole shebang, but either way, it's way more mirrors than I suspect anybody's going to get on board with. And I suspect it's more than we can build given the amount of sand available on Earth. You know, sand is one of the most abundant materials. That's what they make mirrors from. But is there enough sand in the world? It would surprise me. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. And I don't know the, like, the rate of efficiency of turning sand into mirror. Um, like how many, you know, granules they would need. So right. um, there's a lot of sand. Depends on the unit, unit of measurement. If you do grain by grain, it shows a lot. Um, but as far as like actual quantity needed to do that, I don't know. Probably not. Um, right. and I don't think there's going to be rich people who don't want to give up the sand on their beach. So, that's how that yes. works. Even though, even though on many of the world's beaches, more than 50% of that sand is plastic. Oh, because oh, of all the, the plastic and the pollution. Oh, yeah. Yes. They're Ab finding that, yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's crazy. Yeah, they're, finding, they're finding, like, my, microbial-sized plastic. Uh, not that small, but super small little pieces of plastic, like, all over the place. Right, and yep. we, we eat, what, a credit card's worth of plastic every day, I think it is? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't hear that, but okay. No, because it's in everything. It is in oh, everything. Oh, every no, we week. actually have plastic in our bodies. I do know we have plastic in yes, our bodies yes. because of uh, just food consumption. It's a credit card's worth of plastic every week that we consume. Okay. And that's a lot. You know, that is a lot. When, when did that film, The Graduate, come out? 1972, 1973? The Graduate? Yeah, something like that. Early 70s, late 60s, something like that, yeah. Yeah, and, and so the the older gentleman dur turns to, to, to Dust, Dustin Hoffman, who was really young at that time, and and he says, mm. he says, plastics, plastics, son. And Dustin Hoffman is, what are you talking about? Plastics, they're the future. Well, it seems like they're the past now. Yeah, no, they, so, somebody made a lot of money with the uh, up and coming of uh, plastic products. And remember, plastic has petroleum in it, so it ties into the fossil fuel thing. Not just that it's bad for our, our, our digestion, our, our bodies to ingest it, but that's, that's almost a given. Um, but uh, these things are made from fossil fuels, from, from petroleum, which is made from oil, um, which is, again, at the heart of like the, the problem here. So, right. Yeah. Somebody in the chat said microplastics found in every placenta tested, and my my solution for that is to stop testing the damn things. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Um, have you heard anything recently from the IPCC? Like, I mean, because they're they're known for you know they're considered a very conservative scientific organization, meaning that when they publish their their reports, papers, what have you. And they started researching on that data like probably five to ten years prior. Um, and so like it's even antiquated by the time it's published. And that's why you see them coming out with constant updates. And never one time is an update said, sorry, we got it wrong. It's actually not as bad as we thought. It's always, sorry, we got it wrong. It's worse. Yes, absolutely. And for that reason, I don't much follow the IPCC. I mean, I pay attention when they have their COP, when they have their conference of parties every year. If only to listen to the same nonsense year after year. This is the one that's going to fix it. COP27 is the solution. And and now, of course, COP28 is going to be the solution. And, you know, and, and <laughs> of course, they hold these meetings in super cities, places like Dubai. And, and people, people fly in, obviously, from all over the world. And my response to that is, most of us, the masses, the people, we'll say, are charged with conserving fossil fuels. The billionaires, they're charged with conserving aerosol masking. So they keep flying those planes, they keep using the oil just so there's a little bit of aerosol masking so we don't all die right away. We got to thank them for something, right? Yeah, I guess. Um, but, um, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember hearing much you know everything's about uh, ukraine russia and israel and gaza right now um so i'm not hearing a lot about climate change in the news really 
Um, of my own personal research, I do that, of course. Um, and Paul, somebody mentioned Paul Beckwith. And I, that, that's a good name there. Somebody, you know, go on YouTube and check out Paul Beckwith, B-E-C-K-W-I-T-H. Uh, he's still got a lot of good things to say about it. And Re- Regan Parenton's uh, uh, site as well. Um, and, of course, that guest, Dr. Guy McPherson's uh, channel oh, as well. And uh, and you can find my work at guymcpherson.com. And you you can find where Paul Beckwith defames me and calls himself a scientist on his website. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know there was a, a feud there. Oh, there's no feud. No. There's just... Um, Untoward language, we'll say. Gotcha. Okay, I'm um, sorry. Somebody's trying desperately to get a hold of me. In um, so, <laughs> well, okay, yeah. There's probably there's going to be a lot of antagonism out there, you know, among scientists and stuff like that. I mean, everybody agrees on everything, and reasonable people can disagree. I get that, but um, uh, there's very few scientists, I think, that whole, wholeheartedly believe that none of this is happening. I mean, there's some. There's going to be some dissent. You expect that. Well, um, that's usually among the conser- That's usually t- kind of with some sort of political conservative. Role. Well, and I should point out that I didn't know anything about abrupt, irreversible climate change until after I left active service at the university, and so all of my research is rooted in the peer-reviewed literature produced by other scholars. So, I, I haven't been right. in a position to conduct research of my own, except for secondary research reading, organizing, synthesizing other papers. So when I when I reach a conclusion, it's only because other people smarter than me have already reached that conclusion. Okay, cool. Um, so sorry, there's, my neighbor's telling me there's a, a, a robber in our neighborhood. Um, so, okay. Is it, a, um, is it a camp robber or a human robber? A human robber. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess he called the police. He's just warning me. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Um, no, I, just, I need to get back on track here. Um, if, if, you, okay, so let's, go ahead. if you want to put your address there in the chat, probably a bunch of those people who are who are paying attention would run over there and save the day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I recognize some of those names. They all seem like decent people to me. So. Tim Tapio. Tapio is, is checking out uh, the thing here. Yep. You, you, you can use the letter U in that in that word, Kim. You don't have to use an asterisk. It's okay. We're all close here. I don't believe in censorship. <laughs> you know, but um, <laughs> anyway, I appreciate it. Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Robert Leisure is asking, which region of which continent will the first mass extinction event most likely occur? Well, from heat wave, fire, flood, extreme. But when, when, when do you think it's going to hit first? Well, like, hit most majorly first. Okay, well, we're already in the midst of a mass extinction event, and we have been for quite a long time. Um, E.O. Wilson wrote about it in his 2000 and I don't remember what book, but but we've known that we're in the midst of a mass extinction event for quite a long time. It's at, at least the ninth mass extinction event on the planet, not the sixth. And so where's it going to have the most profound impact first? Well, I suspect, and I've been saying this for a long time to the point that it's become embarrassing because I haven't died yet. Uh, I think it will happen in the interior of large continents first because they are so ill protected from the ocean, for example. The ocean is a great ameliorator that ensures that it doesn't get really hot or really cold if you're within a few miles or maybe even a few hundred miles of the coast from an, for an ocean. So I suspect it'll be in the interior of large continents and we're already seeing that obviously in Africa where the intersection between poverty and environmental change has reached its maximum. But we're also seeing a lot of deaths in a lot of other places, large continents like Australia and South America, and to a lesser extent North America because this is where the money is. There's so much money lying around here that governments are able to mitigate for what would be lethal temperatures elsewhere here in this country. Yeah, yeah, no, there's uh, economic uh, 
considerations as well, and even some racial ones. <clears throat> because some of the areas, like as far as like you know, what are they? they you know, people industry tend to like put like all the bad chemically stuff like in poor neighborhoods. Um, you know, so that they so they can keep it away from the rich ones. Um, I'm sure that was a I'm sure that wasn't intentional. Um, but uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, there's all, and it, it, that's one of the things I was saying earlier about like what concerns me so much. Besides just like this apocalyptic prediction, is just like the, what leads up to it is like it's, it's just sort of you know step by step kind of falls away and into disarray. As we see it happening, you have more and more problems going to be happening. These competing groups of people are just going to like converge on each other because it's your fault. No, it's your fault. We have to stop you. No, we have to stop you. Um, politics isn't going to do it. Money's not going to do it. Um, so it's the people are going to like freak out and I mean, you see the protests about climate change all over really, now even more so with like the Palestine thing. Um, but uh, you know, for and against like different like policies being introduced again in Europe, all over Europe, the farmers are, are just taking their turbines and big huge tractors in the downtown areas and spraying manure and dumping manure and food scraps and build hay, uh, bales of hay everywhere on government buildings and blocking uh, driving right through police barricades and chasing police away and stuff like that. I mean, it's madness, man. And again, I don't blame them because it, it's, it, these are very draconian policies being, you know, regulations being imposed on them. I mean, the, the, the attempt of the regulations is to curb climate change. So I can't be opposed to that, you know, but it's, I understand, like, I've been wondering this for a while. I'm like, people aren't going to put up with this. Right, right, wrong, or indifferent, they're not going to. Right. Um, you know, I can yeah. see that happening then. You know, uh, probably most of us remember how people acted during the pandemic, and the, and there were there were relatively insignificant things going on at the grocery store, like you couldn't get toilet paper, and you couldn't get dairy right. products, and people went bananas, and everybody knew this was a relatively short term proposition, right? I mean, right. nobody yeah. thought the pandemic was going to last forever. We're just stuck with it, not being able to get toilet paper. And my res my response to that is, garbage in, garbage out. You don't eat that stuff. You don't need to use the toilet paper. <laughs> to drink water for a year, uh, but uh, <laughs> no, sort of figure out another way. But um, yeah, no, it's gonna kind of like you know, there's just the interconnectedness of the three like primary types of systems we have across the globe: the social, the political, and the economic. You know, one triggers the other, and one you know, they all affect each other. And, it's just, it's just, you know, it's, I'm really concerned about it. Like, I think it's going to get really bad. Yeah, really I, think, bad. I think it is going to get really bad. I think it already is really bad in some places f so far for relatively short periods of time. There have been pretty significant protests throughout Western Europe and especially in the London metropolitan area and, and, and also in Washington, D.C., and, and lots of places th that have experienced these relatively minor things that they, they come and they go, you know, they, they, they're here for a week or 10 days or whatever, and then they get under control, whatever. The, the, maybe the problem goes away or it is alleviated somehow. But we're, I, I agree with you, we're certainly headed for something longer term that is going to have far greater impacts on our society than most of us are willing to admit right now. And I don't look forward to that. No, I don't either. Um, <laughs> I, I like my life being peaceful and not, you know, <laughs> suffering from perturbations of like, you know, gunfire, um, <laughs> or whatever else it is, or robbers in my neighborhood. I don't know, maybe he's reacting to, to, to all these regulations, I'm sure. I'll check that out after the show. but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, it's 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 a scary situation and it's a scary uh, imagery to to consider. Um, again, like you know, the uh, the the protests. I mean, there, there are uh, anti you know climate change protesters, pro environmentalist activists, like shutting down like bridges and, and highways and intersections. I mean, we're not hearing about them as much anymore because I think again, the global world focused on these two these two wars that are happening. Um, but uh, it's still happening. You can look for it. Just go on YouTube and. Greta Thunberg or something like that. You'll you'll find it. Um, it's very much happening, and people are getting mad at that. You know, people. You see people getting out of their cars and like dragging these protesters like off the road, and you know, trying to like slowly drive through the crowds and everything else. And so there's going to be more tension and chaos there. Um, like it's just everything is just coming to like this 
point of singularity is just going to go. Right. It's almost as as if the entire society is coming apart at the seams. No, yeah, I think we're in social de yeah, decline for sure. We're, I think, yeah, this is the end in a lot of different ways. Haiti's in a revolution. What, over a thousand criminals escaped from jail in Haiti or something like that? How, how does that happen? And then they just formed into gangs to go take over the government. How does a thousand people get out of jail? That's weird. Okay, not a very good jail. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's just chaos everywhere. Man. It's just nuts, you know? We have this very controversial election coming up in this country, and climate change is on the docket. You're not hearing about that as much. You're hearing about, like, you know, Biden's old age and, and, and stuttering issues and, you know, Trump's just utter idiocy. But Trump, remember, Trump is a climate change denier. He thinks it's a hoax. Yes. You know, the other things aside, that is what really freaks me out about him the most, is he's going to get in there and he's going to start doing things he should not be doing. Yes. Uh, and that, that's, that's not okay. No, absolutely not. He, <laughs> I've been saying since I was old enough to talk that the latest president is the worst president of my lifetime. And I thought we could... Every single time there was the... Okay, okay. Yeah, and, and I thought we could do no worse than Trump last time around. And sure enough, we got somebody who's completely incompetent incoherent probably probably can't say his own name are you kidding me I, I, yeah it's it's horrifying no, he, he can't barely complete a sentence right it's absolutely horrifying and this is the 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 leader of the so-called free world you got to be kidding me yeah well you know isn't it the the the, the, the anecdote or rumor that uh uh what's her face uh Delamar Roosevelt was running the country because FDR couldn't. That that whole thing. I don't know right. if there's any direct evidence for that, but I mean, people say it. Right. Um, yeah, because he was just not able to. And, um, yeah. Okay. Well, that that that's yeah. That's not great either. So that's going to be interesting to see. You know, I mean, obviously this is a Green Party show. We have our own candidates that we're going to choose from coming up here in a, a week or so. Uh, Jill Stein's kind of high on the list there, and you know, Jill Stein's a great lady. Has a lot of good ideas. Very different challenges and obstacles to overcome for third parties mm -hmm. um, you know because I mean <laughs> the, thing, the whole situation is rigged by the duopoly to keep us off uh, uh, the ballots in multiple states um, you know the, the standards for the duopoly is like here you know, for us for any third party it's like way up here just numerically as far as the amount of petition names to be signed like let, for example this isn't exactly right but just to illustrate the, the proportion uh uh, ratio as like uh you know uh, in tennessee you might need a thousand signatures uh, to get on a ballot if you're a democrat or republican if you're a third party you would need like ten thousand oh. like it's nuts well that that's yeah, no that's, it's crazy and and you're saying that's not fair uh that's what i'm saying yes <laughs> I'm, I'm charging them with uh, charging them with injustice and unfairness wow um so but we got here obviously the optics bush dumb obama Obama, Obama, Dumber, Trump, Dumbest. Now we're sliding with senile Biden. <laughs> yay. Yes, we are. So, yay. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. I don't know what's going to happen. We'll see, we'll see what happens. But, you know, then there's this rumor going around that the billionaires are about building bunkers for themselves, Gates, and, and, and what's his face from Facebook, and, uh, you know, they're building bunkers. I mean, if I was a billionaire, that's what I would do. Um, I, well, if I was Tesla or uh, Elon Musk, I'd build myself a spaceship and just take off. Well, Interestingly, that was my goal when I moved to New Mexico, extremely rural New Mexico, and I built a bunker for myself in the in the way of a homestead, and it included a 40-foot cargo container buried below ground as a root cellar to put food in that would last a long time. And, and then I discovered the aerosol masking effect, the best kept secret in climate science. And also there's the issue of if, if people aren't paying attention, if a significant number of people decide to live off grid and just go underneath the radar, then a whole bunch of nuclear power plants are going to melt down. They're going to strip away stratospheric ozone and superheat the planet beyond survivability for any life at all. And this, this was demonstrated in the 2021 film Finch yeah. in, in a very subtle way. I mean, I doubt, if you, if you didn't know that nuclear power plants melting down would 
cause that outcome, then you you probably didn't get it from the film. But if you know about it, yes, it's right there. It's right in plain sight. So the writers of of Finch knew what was going on, but does anybody else? I can't find it. Don't them. look up. That was another good one. Yes, yes. I love the final scene. I thought that was fantastic. We really oh. did have everything, didn't we? Yeah, right? that's really drives the point on the yeah. That's a signature line. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, no, it's, it's not, it's, it's, too, and there's something, you know, having studied system science, one thing that I do know uh, is that, like, centralized power and authority tends to not be a great idea. Decentralized, when systems are super complex, you want to, usually they run more efficiently when they're decentralized. Um, and, you know, political powers are very centralized types of powers and forces and, 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 and groups. Um, and, like, these cop, uh, uh, you know, meetings and stuff like that, like, they were waiting for, like, you know, uh, you know, out of, out of the whole population of the planet, a very small group of people to kind of, like, fix everything for the rest of us. Um, and I wonder if that's just a really bad way of going about it. Like, just, like, local communities, start doing your thing. Okay, you need to, like, go green, start getting organic stuff going on, permaculture methods and stuff like that. Start dealing with your own, figure it out what, to, that you, what you're going to do, even though you knew the whole time. It was like during the pandemic when the whole thing about like uh, tests, um, the CDC wouldn't let personal doctors get tests from anybody but them, even though then they had to wait for the tests to be made and distributed and everything else. And the doctor's like, I know a dude in Korea, South Korea, who can send me like 10,000 tests right now. No, you're not allowed to do that because we're the big, bad, you know, tough guy CDC. Like, the centralization of power is not a good idea. It's very, very inefficient. Would you agree? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I'm an anarchist. Decentralized power structures, do I mean anarchy? Uh, kind of. Yes. Uh, not anarchy in the sense of chaos, just an anarchy in the sense of decentralization. That's what anarchy is. Right. The, the better aspect of anarchy is. Ch chaos, is the um, absence, chaos is the absence of rules. Yeah. Anarchy is the absence of rulers. It's an important right, point. Sure. There you go. Very, yeah. Everybody has a moral center. Everybody has the ability to reason through things and come up with a better idea. Um, that's what you need for societies to, 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 for people to get along. You don't need external forces determining that for you. Sometimes, obviously, there's going to be some bad apples who do bad things. So you need to be able to protect your community. But, but that's you know, most people are mostly good most of the time. That's kind of the libertarian motto. Like you don't need these like draconian forces teaching you know telling you exactly what to do all the time. It's ridiculous. You 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 probably know how to live a decent life and how right. to treat people. Right. Well, I, and this uh, is obviously optics. Speaking of deals, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. This is my argument against religions. People say that without religions, we'd all go nutso and start killing each other. Really? Really? The exact opposite of what actually happened. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. If you if you yeah, want to find they're, they're real. if yeah. you want to find violence on this planet, look in religious groups. Wow, well, yeah, absolutely. That's the first place you should look. Okay, so obsolete optics. Speaking of Jill Stein, what was she doing sitting at the table? No, oh, General Mike Flynn and Vladimir Putin. I don't know. I have no idea. That's her business. <laughs> um, I saw that video and I have no idea what she was doing. There. Um, but to one dollar, Phoenix, Arizona, or Dallas will be the first to suffer a major heat event. Like Guy said, the interior of continents after September, October, kiss stable, predictable weather. Uh, bye bye. That's from Robert Leisure. Um, okay, yeah. So, well, I mean, yeah, I'm guessing the places that are already super hot now are just going to get hotter than, than this sustainable for any like living creature. I mean, Death Valley is already like pretty much. Oh, yes. And Death Valley. And if, like, if that gets hotter, like, you know, it's all good. Yes, and if we can't grow grains at a large scale, we're screwed anyway. Yeah. Bottom line, it, it, it requires the ability to grow, store, and distribute grains at scale to support any civilization. If we don't have that, civilization goes away, those nuclear power plants melt down. I don't care how much farmland you have in the interior western United States, you're still dead. Well, okay, that's a positive note to end up. Uh, anything you want to plug before we before we call it? Uh, just remember, you can go to Dr. Guy McPherson's website, uh, Regan Perenton, um, his as well. Uh, other people on YouTube. I won't say his name because I guess you guys are not along. <laughs> well, um, but, uh, you can find all my work at guymcpherson.com, and thanks to everybody for leaving comments uh, in in the mm -hmm. comment bar there. 
Um, yeah. How much heat is El Nino? Kim asks, how much heat is El Nino and how much is us? Well, it, it's interesting because we had an unprecedented triple dip La Nina, which greatly cooled the planet. And so now we're seeing an El Nino Southern Oscillation, which releases greenhouse gases and temperature releases heat from the ocean in the world and so how much well ultimately you could argue that it's all us because we're the ones who put those greenhouse gases and all that heat in the ocean to begin with and how much is el nino and how much is us well i i, I don't like to get into the game of it's it's all bill gates's fault and none of it is mark zuckerberg's fault it's it's all all of our faults and and as a consequence we're not responsible for any of it as individuals interesting no, that's a good way to say it um yeah um how long is el nino supposed to last this year like when does it end i've heard so many conflicting reports um some people say that we're uh, nearly at the end that it's it's going to end the day after tomorrow and others are saying it's going to hang on for another year. So I don't know that anybody knows, largely as a result of that triple dip La Nina that we had that served as such a cooling event for a long time. And Robert Leisure has some great advice there in the, in the comment chat. Live early, you know how your loved ones, let them know how you feel. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, it's, now's the time to, you know, carpe diem, seize the day and make your, make your life extraordinary. Um, because it's, uh, we don't, we don't know what, you know, exactly when it's going to happen, but it's certainly coming. Um, well, if we had a triple dip La Nina, go ahead. And, and it's never a bad time to tell people you love them. I used, I used to tell people, I used to tell my students that in classrooms, and there was always some jackass who said, I love you, guy. <laughs> this is on the first day of class, really? Because I don't like you at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um. If we had a triple dip La Nina, should we be expecting a triple bump El Nino in response? Well, you kind of just address that. Like, we don't we yeah. don't know exactly what if it's going to be the day after tomorrow, like you said, or a year from now. Right. Um, but uh, the effects are, are, are palatable, folks. They're they're notable. You can see them happening all the time. Again, it's just all over the planet. Really nasty stuff. Unexpected stuff. That's that's the, 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 the gist of it right there. That's what you're looking at. Is it record highs, record, uh, you know, floods and record rain and you know it didn't snow in new england what do you mean it didn't snow in new england that's nuts you know <laughs> it rained instead uh right. you know 12 feet of snow like just east of san francisco that's insanity right you know um record wildfires i mean just it goes on and then what what, what did trump want to do he wanted to break off the leaves in the forest and that was gonna like solve it i mean are you mine you know it's <laughs> Like notice, a, notice he. Like any futile attempts, was it? He wants the other people to rake up the leaves. He he's never well, seen he a. Else to do. He's never seen a rake. No, I don't think, yeah, I don't know if he's ever like used a power tool, um, or even a hammer. But um, yeah, okay. But uh, okay, cool. Well, it's we're just about it, at the end here. It's, it's interesting that that bringing up Trump brings to your mind using a hammer. <laughs> oh, never mind. Oh, I think I see. <laughs> Maybe okay. maybe, maybe you, you weren't thinking. Are you being covertly? Are you being covertly naughty? Yes, yes. Okay. It's not very covert, apparently. <laughs> I get it. No, I get it. Who's laughing? In the, who's the chuckler in the background? This is partner Pauline, and she's she leaves an occasional comment here. Hi, Pauline. <laughs> Hi. Pauline Project that Love. Was... That's her. Pauline Project Love. Oh, that's sweet. That's cool. All right. Well, all right. Okay, well, maybe the, you know, she can come on next time, too. All right, so I'm going to end it there. Um, so I'm going to go find out if we're being robbed all over the place. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Dr. Guy McPherson. Seriously, it's always a pleasure to have you on. You're, you're very insightful, and you have lots of good information to, 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 that we all need to hear. Thanks for um, the opportunity. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And, and, and now that I'm confident that I have your email, like, I will be in touch, and we'll have you on again soon, hopefully, and sooner or later. And hopefully, you know, again, like you said, hopefully scientists are wrong. And <laughs> you'll be around for a while, but I, I wouldn't be looking for them. Anyway, everybody, thanks for tuning in to the Illinois Green Party. I'm your host, David Ritz. Till next time, be good, be green. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Many people, please talk about wet bulb temperature. Next Can you do time. that quickly?
Uh, okay. Uh, wet bulb temperature refers to the combination of te high temperature and high relative humidity. And for a long time, we thought it was a certain number. And as with almost everything involved with climate science, within the last year, we found out that a number much lower than what we thought was dangerous is actually dangerous. So anybody who's lived in a hot, humid area knows that that can be lethal. That, that combination of heat and humidity is a bad idea. And we're, people, we're seeing people die from it all over the planet. Uh, the, the critical number used to be 35 degrees C at approximately 100% humidity, but there's been peer-reviewed publications that have ratcheted that number way down, even for healthy young adults. Okay, well, more goodness. So, All right, cool. <laughs> six hours. So I, All right, well, I, thanks for asking the question there. I think basically the my conclusion is that we're screwed and we're screwed. Oh, and there's one more thing, we're screwed. Yeah, okay, so that's the trifecta, <laughs> everybody. So, yeah, <laughs> tell, you, tell you everybody you love them and uh, try to enjoy yourself. So, All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Alrighty. Whew, the stream has ended. Sure, that was fun.